Okay, in part three, we're going to talk about budgets, screencasts, visualizers, microphones, and the lightboard. And we're going to start off with a little story about budgets. It's not the central focus of this, but it kind of sets the scene. When you're looking for equipment, what do you need? So we're not in Hollywood yet. Um, and the things that follow, you know, and I've said this a few times, producing videos uh, is not about budget. Well, it kind of is about budget, but I want to show you something interesting that I saw last Christmas, just to give you an idea of, you know, when you see videos on television or when you see different things, you know, there are vastly different levels of budget and effort and equipment that go into things. And the level of result that you get is really, to the untrained eye, can be very, uh, very much similar. Now, we're not making or we're not going to make broadcast quality material in general, but you can get pretty close. So I know this is really unseasonal. Uh, there's about 40 seconds of this. From pet prezzies to family pajamas. From scented candles to the softest cashmere. Make Christmas for everyone with the perfect gift from Dumb Stores. Make Christmas for everyone with our delicious range of mouth-watering Christmas party food. Plus, with our 10 or 50 grocery voucher, you can save even more each time you shop at Dunn Stores this Christmas. So the question is, how much does something like that cost? You know, there was 45 seconds of footage there. Uh, there's a third ad that I didn't show you that's kind of a repeat of another ad. 45 seconds. How many people are involved? Well, I did a poll and everybody, uh, every participant underestimated it. And of course, I don't have exact numbers for how much it cost, but I can show you some images of the set and the setup. And I can say that it would be a vast underestimate to say that there were only 50 people involved. So let's have a look at what's involved in this kind of level of production. So this is a setup. I actually, uh, I was there. I saw this happen, uh, incidentally. and um, very familiar with this house that it happened in. To give you some idea of what happened here, they were there for about six days. And you can see here, this is the outside. They've booked off all the parking outside the house on the street, both sides of the road. And they've actually built a scaffold to make that shot come in the window. So even just looking at this already, you think, wait a second. This is a bigger budget than we might have thought. I mean, even looking at that picture there before we look at anything, we can see that there are uh, lots of vans, lots of trucks. There's a whole scaffolding set up. There's a lot of people involved here. And what I won't show you is that around the corner, at the local football club, they set up a dining car for all of the people involved to go work around. So how many people are we actually talking about? Well, this isn't the dining uh, venue around the corner. This is actually set up in the back garden. This is where they were preparing the props. So there were five or six or so people in a large marquee which had a large amount of equipment. There are the five ovens you can see at the back there. There's also a whole set of fridges, freezers, all sorts of other bits and pieces. And that's only for setting up the props. That's nothing to do with feeding the people who are working on set. And of course, this came with an on-site generator, 24 hour security, and all sorts of other bits and pieces that you probably just don't think about. So even before we've gotten inside to look at the set, there's the catering, there's the prop manufacturing, there's security, there's logistics, there are an awful lot of people involved. And we haven't even gotten inside the venue where the recording is gonna happen. Haven't even seen the people who are gonna be doing this. Inside then you can see, if you look at this uh, setup on the right, you can see that there's actually, that didn't make it into the ad. At least I don't think it made it into the ad. But they have a whole setup. Look at all the lights, the cameras, the pre-roll. And then at the outside, they have all of this monitoring equipment. So you're talking about hundreds of thousands of euro worth of equipment. Now they don't buy it, they rent it but still several thousand euro to rent that for a few days. You can see then this is what did appear in the ad. Uh, they've totally revamped it, set it up entirely differently. A whole new set of props, different table, uh, you know, different camera setup, all sorts of different work going on there. So this is a high value production. I can tell you that there is one piece of furniture in, so there's two rooms there, there's this room and that room, which are one large connected room. And there is only one single piece of furniture in that room which actually belongs in that house. Every other piece of furniture was moved out by a moving crew, put into storage for the five or six days that they made the ad, and then moved back and rearranged, having taken photos beforehand of 
what was going on in the room. So literally to the point that they rearranged the things on the shelves exactly as they were with photos to direct them. So the estimates about this, there was at least 50 people involved, but it could have been a multiple of that. 50 is like the low low end of the estimate and the budget for that at a very minimum would be 100,000 euro, probably two, two and a half times that. So it could have been a quarter of a million euro. And what they produced with that was 45 seconds of footage. So you're talking about 2,000 euro per second of footage in terms of what you're seeing on TV. And you have to, in some senses, bear in mind that when you're trying to make videos, it would be nice if it looked like the gun store's Christmas ad, but not, not gonna happen in that sense. And it is very, uh, very possible, you know, if you were to try and make that ad yourself and you were to spend 1,000 euro and you were to use a much more budget camera and the lights you had around and you were to cook the food yourself, that you could make something that was 90% as good. And so there's this kind of graph, uh, which I, I just made, it's not based on anything, but it really applies to everything that you're gonna do in making videos, is that if you spend absolutely no money, if you buy a microphone for 10 euro, it's probably gonna be terrible. If you buy a cheap uh, knockoff of a GoPro for 10 euro or 20 euro, it's probably gonna be terrible. But if you buy something that's, you know, 50 or 100 euro and it's half reasonable, it is gonna be, you know, 70%. First class honors, you know, it's gonna be good, reasonable quality. By the time you're at 200 euro, you're kind of like 85% of the way there. And way off to the right here, you can see that like way off to the right there, if you're spending 10,000 euro or 100,000 euro on your camera and your lens, you're getting broadcast quality 9.9. .9. But for, you know, a hundredth of the price, you can get something that is really, uh, really high quality. And so I can't emphasize that enough. When you're making things, when you're making videos, if you're using uh, really poor equipment, you'll get really poor results. But any kind of investment at all in terms of how much effort you put in, how much time you put in, and the kind of equipment that you use, most of the YouTube videos that I shot, I shot with a 300 euro camera. Um, you know, you're you're talking about getting pretty good returns. So we're aiming for somewhere around this corner here. We'd like to be like 70 or 80%. We'd like to be a good first class honors video. You know, we don't want to be a, you know, this is a fine art belongs in a museum. We just want to do a decent job. And actually to do that, most of the things that you see there, you really don't need. So you have four choices of video type, or the, I'm going to do four cho choices. You can break this down and you can look at different things um, how you want. The first one is a screencast. So if you've never made a screencast before, it's probably the easiest kind of video to start making. You don't have to leave your desk and there are loads of different bits of software to do it. So at this point in the webinar, I actually had a video ready uh, which showed you how to do a screencast. And somebody pointed out that PowerPoint also does screencasts pretty well these days. It's definitely not terrible. So I've changed that video and here's the new one. Okay, we're going to make a quick screencast here using Microsoft PowerPoint. So first thing I want to do is open up a presentation and then I'm just going to put in a new slide and we're going to put a screencast in here. You might already be familiar with uh, using PowerPoint to annotate or record over slides, but you can actually also insert a screencast. So if you go to insert and then you click on screen recording, you can actually cast anything else on your computer. So once you have that set up, it'll automatically alt and tab to the next thing open. So here's the first lesson when you're making screencasts is that you have to be sure that whatever it skips to is something that you want other people to be able to see. Windows actually supports multiple desktops. So if you push control, Windows button and right, it'll move you to a fresh desktop, which can sort out a lot. You still have to clean the icons off, but at least you don't have a million programs open. Once you've got that done, you can select your area. So I'm just gonna select the entire screen and you can turn on audio or you can turn off audio and then you can start recording. And it'll give you three, two, one countdown. And now it's recording everything I do. So if I move the mouse around or supposing I want to record a screencast about uh, making Moodle quiz questions, I can go into the question bank and like any other screencast software, it will just capture anything that's happening. So I can go through all of these and so on and so forth. Once I'm done then, uh, I have to push Windows key, Shift and Q 
to stop it. And now when I go back to my PowerPoint, I can see that this media file is in there. And if you want, then you can save all of this as part of your PowerPoint presentation. Or alternatively, you can right click on it and you can save it. And once you've done that, then we can just put it straight onto the desktop in this case. And when you play it back, then you can see it's just recording whatever's happening on the screen. So it follows your mouse and so on and so forth. It's like any other regular uh, screencast recorder. Another possibility is that you just want to voice over your PowerPoint slides. So click the record button that's highlighted in red and you get to a screen like this. And now you can record over your animated slides and you can annotate them using a pen. The writing functionality is pretty limited. You can see here, you can uh, choose your pen and start writing. And then when you hit the uh, record button, it'll give you a countdown. So it'll count you in three, two, one, and now you can start writing on it. But if your slides are animated or if they have playing media in them and you try and write on them, like I'm gonna do here, well then what will happen is the screen will continue to move on and your writing will stay static. But it works very nicely if your uh, animation doesn't require moving from slide to slide or doesn't actually having have real moving content on each slide. In which case you can very nicely highlight different aspects and move on to the next slide and record the voice. And all of this is recorded and embedded in the slide itself. So when we push the stop button, what you end up with is a series of voice media files on each particular slide. So you can see here, the annotation now appears. And if you click on the annotation, you can delete it if you want. And the sound file appears. And just like the video, you can right click on the sound file and save it somewhere if you want that sound as a separate thing. The last thing then is if you want to save this to make it available on YouTube or somewhere like that, you have to save it as a .mp4 file. So go to save as, and when you've decided on your save location, select the file type and select mpeg4 or .mp4 or mp4s as they're known. And then just save it uh, as normal, put in a title for it. Uh, we'll call this one test. And when you go to save it, it actually takes quite a while for it to save because it has to encode the video, which is a processor intensive thing to do. So if you don't have a fast computer, it can take quite a while. Or if you have a long presentation, it can take quite a lot, quite a while. So it's not always gonna suit as a way to make a screencast. And in fact, there are other ways to make a screencast. Uh, some of them are inbuilt into Windows. So let's have a look at another one of those. So in this case, I'm just back in PowerPoint as a program. I'm not gonna use it to record. And instead, what I'm gonna use is the built-in game bar functionality. So it's built in into Windows. And all you have to do to bring it up is to push the start button or the Windows key and G. And when you do that, you get this interface. And this is designed for people who wanna use Xbox to capture themselves playing computer games. But it will also do in a pinch to record uh, different bits of software. Now. If we compare the videos at the end, it does have its limitations. In this example, I'm doing a screen capture from Excel and you can see on the right, what should appear is missing in the uh, game bar capture because it doesn't actually capture the screen accurately. So it doesn't work in all cases. It also doesn't give you a pre-roll. So there's no cue, just once you push recording, it starts recording. But on the upside, it does capture the sound your system is making. So it has some advantages. If you're looking for the video that you've captured, you'll find it in your default video folder in a subfolder called captures. And you can upload these videos directly to YouTube or Stream or wherever you want to. The other possibility then is to get a program like Screencast-O-Matic or Camtasia. You can see the websites here and there uh, you have to pay for them. You can download them and use them. They have pretty similar usability to the PowerPoint feature, except that they're standalone programs. Um, you can download a free trial and see if it's more suitable for what you need. Their quality is no better or not much better than the PowerPoint. The truth is, if you want to get a really high quality image capture, you actually have to capture it direct from your signal that's coming out of the back of your computer or your laptop, in which case you're into purchasing different hardware and you're into a whole different ball game. There are limited samples of that hardware available in the college, but really, unless you're looking for a very specific niche use, it's not gonna be necessary. So I hope that shows you where you need to be. You can do a lot with PowerPoint or the built-in Windows record feature. If you find those too limited, you can branch out to things like Screencast-O-Matic or Camtasia, you will have to pay for them. Or if you really need to, you can do signal capture. Okay, that's all for this video. So if you're gonna make a screencast, there are two pieces of equipment that are important. Uh, one is your screen. So the screencast that you make is 
the resolution of the screencast you make is going to depend on the resolution of the screen that you make it on. So if your screen in work or on your laptop is a poor old low resolution screen, the video that it captures is going to be old, low resolution. And that will appear fine on your screen because it's a screen that you used. But if you put it onto a larger screen or a mobile that's higher resolution, it's going to look bitty and clunky and really not great. So I would suggest, if you can at all, when you're using a screen to do screencasts, try and find something that is at least HD. So at least 1920 by 1080. I would say actually any higher than that and you're kind of wasting your time, but 1920 by 1080 or HD video is really kind of a sweet spot because you need a good screen to be able to visually make uh, make out the difference that are of things that are higher resolution than that. But if things are too much lower resolution than that, then they just appear a little bit clunky. The other thing that is uh, really important is your microphone and where it is. If you want to know what resolution your screen is, if you right click on the desktop and go to display settings, it will bring up um, information about your screen. And you can see my laptop screen is only uh, 1366 by 768, but I actually have a second screen plugged in and it is a HD screen. The videos, because I have made screencasts on the one that's 1366 by 768, but they just look kind of terrible when you play them on anything that isn't a really small screen. So it's it's just, uh, that's more experience than, you know, it's not a, if the only screen that you have is a high resolution screen, it's no biggie. So you can't do too much about your screen short of buying a new one, but you can do a lot about your microphone. And I can't uh, possibly overemphasize how that graph applies. So how the law of diminishing returns applies. If you spend no extra money on your microphone and you just use a built-in microphone like you see in the laptop on the left-hand side, then it's your sound is probably going to be terrible. Now, if you have a really fancy Mac, you might get away with it. But even still, any vibrations in the computer, if you're touching your keyboard at all, you're just going to have terrible sound. As you go from left to right here, you can um, you just get better and better results. And the right here actually tops out at about 180 euro. And way off to the right, there are broadcast quality microphones that cost 10 or 20 or 40,000 euro. But if you're gonna buy a microphone, depending on who is paying for the microphone, you can buy a headset 20 or 30 euro and you get reasonably good sound. And um, they work really well for things like this. I'm actually using, uh, if you wanna see, you know if you can see my video. Um, this microphone. So I'm actually using the microphone on the far right there. Um, I brought it home before the lockdown. I thought it would come in handy. Um, but even if you use a headset, the only problem with headsets is that they are stuck right next to your mouth. So they pick up all the sounds. Uh, you know, if you cough or whatever, you know, it's going straight uh, into that microphone. Whereas with a microphone that's uh, on the desk and a little bit distant from you, then you can get much better sound quality. And I'll give you a quick demo of that sound quality in a second. I'll give you another link. Um, the other thing is, you know, you can get uh, conference microphones like this. So a conference microphone, if you uh, have one, you know, it can work really well and can pick up reasonably good quality sound, but it's going to pick it up from all directions equally. Whereas if you pick up a microphone uh, from the right hand side, they are directional. So it'll only pick up the sound or predominantly pick up the sound that's directly in front of it. And it won't pick up the sound so much if the sound is off to the right or around the back. And that can be really useful if you have uh, a room that's not ideal. The other thing, if you are going and buying um, a microphone, there's basically two kinds of microphone that you can buy. And if you go looking, you know, if you start just from blank and you're like, oh, I want to buy a microphone. There is an awful lot of material out there on microphone types and people will tell you this, that, and the other. There are basically two kinds. Uh, there are condenser microphones and there are dynamic microphones. And a condenser microphone has a big uh, circular diaphragm in it. So in the top of this microphone, there's actually, you know, probably an inch wide is the microphone uh, itself. And it's a little capacitor and it has to have a power supply. So it needs power to run. On the other hand, the dynamic microphones are just like speakers. And as they move, they move inside a magnetic or a magnet inside a coil and they generate a voltage. So they don't need power. In any case, 
What I would say is that it is really important that you buy a USB microphone and that you don't buy a microphone that you plug into the sound card on your laptop. And the reason for that is that if you buy a laptop uh, or if you buy a microphone that plugs into the sound card in your laptop, often there can be some hum in the circuit or you know the power supply that's uh, delivering power to that sound card isn't um, well protected from noise on other circuits. And so you end up with this persistent background hum that is impossible to get rid of. Even if your microphone costs 10,000 euro, if you plug it into a bad sound card, then you are just gonna have poor quality sound. And the cost of getting a good quality sound card and the hassle of it is just not worth it. On the other hand, if you buy a USB microphone, all of that circuitry is powered from the USB power supply. And the USB power supply is pretty good in terms of its nice, direct, clean current. And then it goes through further filters inside the microphone itself. So to give you an idea of the different sound quality you can expect, I recorded a sample video here, which is gonna play now. We're just gonna compare the quality of three different kinds of microphone. It's important that your microphone picks up your sound, but it doesn't pick up background sounds. Background sounds can be very distracting. It's important that your microphone picks up sound, but that it does not pick up background sound. Background sounds can be very distracting. It's important that your microphone picks up sound, but that it doesn't pick up background sound. Background sound can be very distracting. It's important that your microphone picks up sound, but that it does not pick up background sound. Background sound can be very distracting. Your distance from the microphone can be very important. Your distance from the microphone can be very important. Eliminating background noise is important. Choosing the mic right microphone is also important. I think it's fair to say from that that there's a very noticeable difference and a little budget can go a long way towards really improving your sound quality. Now, if it's only a 30 second clip in the middle of some video, the background noise is not so annoying, but if you are persistently listening to that hum, then it's just not gonna work out. Sorry. The price difference between the microphone that's built into your laptop, which is zero, and the headset, and then the you know decent microphone on the right. The one that I have, I think it's 180 euro or something like that, uh, GMIT bought it. Um, but even if you spend 100 euro and get a decent condenser microphone, it's gonna sound much, much better. And I know, uh, I can see in the comments there, that it is possible to clean up audio. So if you record noisy audio, then you can clean that audio up afterwards and you can put that editing step in. But it's like, it is possible. Uh, it's just, it's not going to be as good as recording decent audio in the first place. And when the effort required to record decent audio is just having a microphone that costs, you know, 100 euro, I think we can ask our schools, you know, if they're expecting us to uh, deliver online now from September, I think that's the kind of thing that you can ask your school to provide you with. Um, and I, I do think at some point they're going to have to think about, you know, sending out reasonable quality microphones for making uh, good videos. I mean, obviously, if you have a headset, it can work pretty well. Um, and if you're just doing live things, then it, it, it works quite well. But it's worth it's worth the investment. I would suggest it's worth the investment. It's not at all worth the investment than going to a thousand euro or ten thousand euro. So somebody's kind of preempted what I was going to say next. Um, which is having the best microphone in the world is not going to help if you are in the room that looks like the left here. If your room is full of Spartan marble surfaces that reflect sound, then that's no help at all because you're going to sound bad either way. Um, now, I'm just in a, you know, this room I'm in was a bedroom, it's now an office. Uh, it's got soft furnishings in it and the sound is pretty good. If you are really in a pinch, you can do what this person in the middle is doing, which is just put a blanket over your head. So if you want to make 30 seconds of quality sound, you can't do it for an hour because you'll just melt under there. But if you want to make 30 seconds of quality sound, then you just put a blanket over you and your laptop and your microphone and you can record 30 seconds of decent quality sound. Obviously, that's not practical. And actually just doing it in a room that doesn't have lots of, you know, hard surfaces pointing back at the microphone is going to work really well. At the other end of that, then you can... Um, you can go into a recording booth and there are three or four recording booths, possibly more actually at this stage uh, in GMIT. I'm not sure what the access is going to be with them because they are pretty confined closed spaces. So even if you're, you know, in there and then you leave again, you're still going to have to clean it down and that kind of thing. But they do exist. Um, it's not that hard to get into a recording studio style uh, environment. But all that I'm really saying here is if you are recording audio for a video, 
try and not do it in a room that is brick walls uh, and nothing on them. Try and do it in a room that is has got soft furnishings. And that can be, you know, somebody was saying, I think Orly, you were saying there, that you just, yeah, rugs and pillows and that kind of thing. Um, and you just, you massively reduce the echo. I don't think there's too much echo here on my microphone. And it's just, you know, it's a room with normal soft furnishings, uh, not too much exciting. But again, if you're trying to make the best video you want to make, then you can go to the recording booth. So that's one possibility is making a screencast. And all you need for your screencast is your computer. It's worth making that investment in a microphone. So the next kind of video, uh, that I just want to go through is making a visualizer video. And you probably recognize the picture in the middle there or the, the first picture on the on the side there as being a visualizer. Well, you can use those quite effectively. Um, if we'd all brought the visualizers home from the lecture halls, we could just use them at home. They usually plug in USB into a computer and they come with their own capture software. So you can just capture whatever you're going to do. And they're really useful to give you an idea of what that's going to look like, you can look at the link there. The setup that I did those on, this is actually the room I'm in right now. It's got the wardrobes. I just had a camera and I pointed it at an A4 sheet of paper. So it doesn't have to be a built, uh, a special specialized visualizer, but they do exist in college. They're all over the place. But the other possibility is just tripod, camera, sheet of paper. Uh, in terms of borrowing them, I was I don't think they're going to be used during the year, so I'd say there will there'll have to be a system for borrowing them. Here's an example though of a screencast, and you can see it is literally just a pen, a page, and writing on a piece of paper. And it's really quite an effective way of getting across a message, and it's really easy to do. So if you're a chemist, you'll know where that's going. But if not, you can see it's just writing on a page, and it's a really nice uh, way of doing things pretty quickly. Um, again, record it. Uh, edit it and put it up. And the only thing I would say, if you're making either way, if you're making screencasts or if you're making visualizer videos, just put a title slide. It doesn't take too much effort to make a title slide and it makes it a lot easier for the students to know what the video is going to be about before they click on the video in streams or on YouTube or any of those things. So if you have a visualizer, great. And there are visualizers in GMIT. You may have to record the sound separately, in which case go back to the earlier mic conversation and try and get a reasonably good microphone. Um, if you're using a camera and tripod, so a lot of those visualizers actually come with LEDs built in and they'll illuminate the page. If you're using a camera, then you have to have a think about the lighting. So you may have to get a desk lamp or something like that. It's nice to do post-production on them, but it's not essential. And it's nice to add in an intro slide and maybe an outro slide so that they know what course it belongs in or what's going to happen. It's not essential. So visualizer videos are again, you know, you can churn them out. It might take you 10 minutes to dig out the lecture slides that you want to do and have a think, 10 minutes to record the video, and then maybe 10 minutes to upload it. So maybe 30 minutes for a 10 minute video, maybe an hour if it's taking a while. You get faster as you do it. Um, the other possibility then is the light board. And I know some of you will have seen my sales pitch for the light board before. So this is room 929 in college and the light board just lets you record straight in front. And you can see there all of my writing is backwards. So when that video gets uploaded, then I flip it. Uh, so I just mirror it in post-production editing. And it's I think it's a nice style of video. Um, if you want to use it, you can use it. Uh, it's you know It doesn't offer any more information than a visualizer. But studies suggest, uh, different studies that I have read, um, would suggest that if your face is in the video, it promotes better engagement because the students, you know, learning is a social thing. So it's better if you are actually visible in the video. They can also then track, you know, your eyes are following the things as you write them on the board. So just a, a demonstration of, you know, this is the board itself. And you can see that my eyes carefully track what it is that I'm writing on the board. And so it gives the students an idea of, you know, what's important, what's not important, where you're looking when you're talking about different things, as opposed to the visualizer, which is just entirely, um, you know, a white page and no visual cues in terms of people. And visual cues, as you'll know, are really important. Uh, delivering these webinars is much harder because there's an absence of visual cues. But it's there. Uh, there will be an SOP set up for it. Um, so I don't know what the, what the future holds in terms of accessing those kind of things but it will be there as a possibility. 
So those first three, you know, making a lightboard video is going to take you a little bit longer than a visualizer because it's not at your desk at home. But again, you know, 10 minutes of writing, 10 minutes to read your lecture slides, think about what you're going to do, 10 minutes to download it, and maybe another few minutes of chopping the ends off and putting it up on your thing. And you have your video within an hour. So at the top of these, you know, you get really fast turnaround and it's typically maybe three, four, five to one in terms of how many minutes you have to spend making the video versus how many minutes you have to spend uh, or how many, how many minutes of video you get. So for every five minutes that you put into making it, you might get one minute of video back out again for the, you know, screencast definitely really efficient. And by the time you're at the light board, that could be out to five to one. So in the next part, we're going to look at recording live action video, which is a much more time intensive pro process, but that gets us to the end of part three. As ever, if you have any questions, post them below or send me an email and I'll try to get back to you.